Hello, listeners, and welcome back to another episode of Quote Unquote with KK. It's a very auspicious day today, and I wish all our listeners happy Ganesh Chaturthi. And we wish that the world is with the blessings of Lord Ganesha, is a peaceful and a prosperous world. Coming back to our podcast today, we had released our Healthcare Life Sciences Investment Manifesto for India, and we talked about how things are going going to transition and how the world is going to look like in the next five years and what bet India needs to take in the healthcare and life sciences space. And hence, our podcast was themed happiness, happenings and hookup. Now, if you go through our investment manifesto, our bet number three discusses on anti-aging tech and product that is going to be a major trend in the next five years. And why is it so? You see, today, the 50s is the new 30s and the present Gen X and seniors would like to see how to reverse their age or age slowly. And let me tell you, as part of Think Tank for the Bharat Varsh 2047 team, I had been working and making several recommendations. And some of the key takeaways over there is that by 2047, when India turns 100, we're going to have over 300 million senior citizens and our dependency ratio is going to be over 40%. And which means that we need to be investing a lot more into our generation geriatric and senior citizens healthcare. But what if we could do something better? If we could extend the lifespan by 20 to 50 percent of our current people who are going to be senior citizens and ensure that this prolonged life is a healthy one rather than a prolonged decline, decay and disease that many Indians would suffer in their old age, that would probably be taking a lot of our healthcare resources and costs. And hence, the whole topic today, which is rebooting age long of India. To discuss this whole opportunity and topic, I have invited a very prominent scientist and a thought leader who's also initiated a new platform called Longevity India. Now, as usual, we do a fact check of what chat GPT profile of our speakers look like. And here's what chat GPT says about Dr. Deepak Kumar Saini. Dr. Deepak, as I keep talking in my podcast as Doc, Dr. Deepak or Deepak is a prominent professor at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, which is India's leading research and development institution in the League of the IITs for life sciences and many other sciences. He is part of the Department of Development of Biology and Genetics, and he is associated with the Department of Bioengineering. His research primarily focuses on signaling in aging, anti-inflammation, infection, with a particular interest in microbacterium tuberculosis. Deepak has an extensive education background including a PhD in biotechnology from Ames, New Delhi and a postdoctoral fellowship at Washington University Medical School and the University of Arkansas Medical Sciences. His work has been published in numerous journals contributing significantly to the field of aging and infectious disease. One of his key areas of interest is how aging affects the immune system and its ability to respond to infection. I would be very honored to have Dr. Saini talk talk about how do we develop strategies to improve health span, combating age-related diseases, and the platform that he now heads, Longevity India. I will talk about Longevity India as well, very briefly. It's a platform that has been launched by IISC, and I would let Dr. Saini talk about it as well, about the platform, his team, what the their agenda and their charter is. But I would love to just make a small comment before I let let Deepak talk about it, is our friend and an investment manager, Prashant Prakash of Axel Partners. He has been a founding patron for giving a grant to start this whole initiative in India, which is to me a very honorable and a very, very intellectual initiative that could add a lot much more to what's happening in India, both from research and industry development. So welcome to the podcast, Deepak. It's a pleasure having you on our podcast today. Today. Hello, KK. Thank you so much for your invitation. First of all, happy Ganesha Chaturthi to everybody. And as the Ganesha says, may everybody live healthy and happy. And I think this should be the tagline for our Longevity India initiative also, because that's exactly uh, what we are aiming to work in this country. We actually want everybody to be happy as Ganesha and as prosperous as Ganesha and I live longer as Ganesha. So I think with that theme, to what KK said, we are starting this Longevity India initiative. Actually, 
we have started it in Indian History of Science. And uh, if it's all right, I will spend next couple of minutes to describe you what exactly this initiative is all about. Sure, please, please uh, go ahead. Uh, although uh, we had a sequence on it, but uh, I would love to kind of first take this uh, off the bat. But before that, I wanted to ask a few fundamental questions. Sure. Before sure. we Let's get into go. why longevity and what this is all about. Sure. What is aging? Just as a basic fundamental definition and why do people age? I think if you think about aging from a very, very, you know, rudimentary or outside the box viewpoint, everything which has got a shape and architecture, which could be living and non-living things, undergoes deterioration of this basic fundamental design over time because of use, misuse or simple getting old. And that is it. very simplest to speak. So if you have any item, a vehicle, the day it was manufactured and as it's manufactured, it is losing its fundamental character because of usage. It undergoes aging and the human body is one of the same thing, which undergoes aging as a function. On this Just, question on aging, you know, yeah. there are several concepts of measuring age. You know, yes. in our finance system, assets are aged in different ways, right? Yes. But in humans, age could be measured in very different ways. You know, there is a Absolutely. chronological calendar age, there's a biological age, there's a physiological age, there's a sociological Absolutely. age. Now with the advancement in sciences, we also have metabolic and physical age. Then there is the gut age. And there are many other uh, scientists and, and people, thought leaders who have defined age in a very different way. So yes. could you help us elaborate what's the best way to measure human age? No, it's, it's a very interesting point. It's a fascinating point. And I think uh, this point is at the heart of what we are trying to do also. Given that there's so much noise in this, given that there's so many options. Actually, right now the aging area is almost like go, going to a buffet. You can choose whatever you like for your age to be, but it will not satisfy you because there's always something which looks better than what's on your plate. And that's a fundamental problem. We have not understood aging very well till now, simply because as a human race, we were always more fascinated about how not to die young. And that is always a main thing. We were always worried about infectious diseases, nutrition, and wars. And now since we have more or less tackled these three major killers of humanity, uh, we have shifted our attention to how not to die now old. So basically, the idea is that how can we live long and how can we live healthy as much as possible? So the shift of model of modern modern science have gone towards health span. So lifespan is something more or less is constant for humanity. We do not believe that we would like to be aligning with the lifespan extended, but I would like to you know associate myself with health span. And one of the main thing would be well, how do you categorize somebody's age as you rightly are? Is it metabolic age? Is it biological age? Is it physiological age? And I think this is like asking somebody is what's your favorite color? You can choose different lenses, different approaches. And why so much diversity? Because we still have not understood the underlying cause, underlying driver, underlying changes which occur in human body as a function of age. And more so in context of India because India is, you know, Indians are genetically, metabolically, economically, they're very different. So while the West says measure this, measure that, it does not necessarily will apply to India. So right now, the canvas is empty for us. The canvas is white. We can choose our, uh, you know, characters to draw on that, but it's going to be a while before we decide what defines our aging in biological terms rather than chronological. Terms. It is still an open story. That's a great starter to the topic today. And let me just delve a little bit deep into it because now that there is clarity of age, you see there are various tools on the website and internet that are providing calculators and then tests available to measure your correct age. I wanted to understand, are these scientific calculators or tools or tests validated? And should people fall for into these traps of subscribing to these sort of platforms and conducting these sort of tests? So great question, KK. And I think the question which you asked, the answer is within your question. Is that should people fall for it? So again, a, a rigor in a scientific question comes from how many people agree to make the same observations which somebody is claiming. The Newtonian experiment, the apple falls, well, so should orange and so should papaya and so should coconut be. The experiment got repeated itself multiple ways, multiple platform. Exceptions are not to be. So it becomes a hard fact that there is gravity. And that same rule applies for a lot of fundamental discoveries. Which, However, for aging, given that we have recently woken up to aging and we're still not invested on the fundamental science, there's a lot of gimmick which is out there. A lot of them are based on early stage of scientific discoveries, which still needs a lot of testing and validation in a larger population. But 
but given that the market is demanding such things to be there i think just like any other place india also the demand decides what the supply should be there is a lot of kits k ages calendars calculators which have been launched there reliability of every one of them is questionable because if you use two or three or four different calendar you will realize you have two different age group but more or less if you think very carefully what this calendars are trying to tell you is very simple which they are trying to tell you how good is your metabolism in your body does your body have high signs of inflammation basically signs of deterioration and more or less if you check these two boxes you will be able to put your chronological age and your biological age in one basket you might end up saying that i am biologically younger or biologically older based on an inflammatory and metabolic signature and that's what the reliability of these markers as of now stand given that now we have understood all this there's a lot of stuff on the internet again and people when you do, do search you know terms like uh, age reversal anti aging age renewal rejuvenation defying age longevity come up and yes. i'm although they may sound very similar but i'm a bit confused and i would love your clarity as to what is the difference between all these terms such as anti aging age reversal age renewal rejuvenation defying age longevity because now you are also doing longevity related platform just for the simplicity of our audience you'd love to understand you know are they the same or are they used interchangeably in a wrong context or what are they great question kk i think these nomenclatures are as baffling to a common person as to us that why do we need so many different nomenclature to describe or ascribe or define something which fundamentally same thing everybody want is to figure out ways to slow down the rate of aging which we are undergoing and that is largely to extend our lives great so why do we i need to call it anti aging because it's catchy i would be able to sell my two bit of wisdom very easily if i say anti aging because aging has got a very huge negative connotation in an audience i can ask you to do a survey you take 500 people and ask how many of them would like to live long and i'm sure almost 90% people will raise their hand and if you ask those same people how many of them want to get old i bet nobody would raise their hand because we do not want to get old but we want to live long so that is the whole grail of the you know the documented market where anti aging is a pro seller age reversal is even bigger sir people tell i'll reverse your age and who doesn't want to get everybody says ki kaash ki hum 5 saal pehle ye kara so that means it's an age it's a time thing we don't want to do that but at the same time we would like to feel younger feel younger means reversal and that's what we people want to do but pretty much what you're trying to do is you're improving your body's metabolism you're keeping the inflammatory markers in check so you physically start feeling younger it's not an age reversal it's basically signature reversal. you are fitter because you're taking care of yourself and that's what is another way of telling people that they need to take care of themselves and that's age reversal longevity coming to another term which we use longevity is dictionary meaning means durability durability means if i'm going to do something to my body an adverse event how rapidly can i restore back to my fitter state and to start executing as normal people undergo surgery they make made some accidents how fast does the person come back to the norm and that's durability and that's what is longevity is all about how durable can i be in long term age renewal is another term to use about age reversal there is nothing bit you know two bit different between them rejuvenation and rejuvenation by word itself sounds fancy it's like uh, making a new candle out of the old wax so which which is a fascinating point to say so everybody would like to rejuvenate can i renew my body such that i can start abusing it again that's a very crude way of putting it but that's what most people want to do i have heard people say that i run a job because if i run a job i will not put on weight if i don't put on weight i can eat so the luxury of reversal rejuvenation anti aging is people want to relive the moments which make them feel happy about themselves now you can do it multiple ways defying age is another term which you have used defying age means you know you deny your physiological aging such that you even if the as you said in the beginning in the last time when we met you know you are older but you look younger that's defying age a classic example a lot of people feel very good about it because of course it's a thing to feel good about that you are actually not looking older but that is simply because we attach a negative connotation to getting older if everybody is fitter around you the defying age would not be a unique concept it will be the norm and we would not call it defying age we'll actually call it aging grace having dignity in aging and that's why people will find new 
purpose in life. So all these nomenclatures for naming are basically for those who would like a quick, quick solution to the people who are who have invested and in understand longevity. For them, these words pretty much mean the same. It's no difference because they've already adopted the culture of long. But all these nomenclatures which you talked about, they are for the non-practitioner. They are for the gimmicky, the star power seeking people who want to figure out what works best for them without really investing themselves. That's the difference. For the learned, they are same. For the unlearned, they're all different. You need to figure out where you want to sit on. Well said. Now I want to jump in about you. Let's talk a little bit about you and longevity. What is your interest in your journey in longevity? So, you know, this question I can uh, talk for hours because it's been a very interesting ride. I was in, I've been working on a lot of biological problems. I was trained in AIMS, completely different area. My work in US was in another different area, which is regarding pain and drug pharmacology. So uh, I would say I mean, I'm an accidental adventurer in longevity space. It was a serendipitous observation during my studies in US that I was looking at a molecule which seemed to be doing something to aging. And it kind of stuck with me and I said, you know, why didn't we come back to India and start my own group? Maybe this is something I would like to work. And I had an even more adventurous student with me who said, you know, this problem is what I'm fascinated. Let's work on it. And I think way back in 2010, when I started my lab in India, we started the first uh, sets of serious experiments in trying to understand how cells in our body undergo aging and what kind of new design of aging occurred. And that's led slowly uh, to get us, you know, interested to dwell deeper into aging, aspects of aging. And about the last few years back, what we had a very interesting conversation, a lot of my colleagues in the department and the institute, I'm part of several departments, and we were talking and I realized that, you know, our education system, which is one of the best in the world, and has actually generated a humongous number of specialists. Uh, we take pride in generating specialists. And actually, the modern education system has motivated everybody to become a specialist in something. There is a gastroenterologist, there is an ophthalmologist, there's an endocrinologist, and everybody becomes specialists. So when I was talking to this interesting eclectic group of faculty in our institute, I realized we have a colleague who looks at gut microbiome. I have a colleague who looks at ovarian cancer. I have a colleague who looks at pancreas. I have a colleague who looks who's a bioengineer, who is one colleague who looks at genetics. There's one colleague who's looking at lung, one at immune system. I said, you know what? This is a fascinating group of individuals, but they're all specialists. To problem like aging and longevity, you need a journalist, somebody who is a naturalist, somebody who can understand and integrate these small bits under one umbrella. Now, given that we all were already, you know, specialists and asked us to become just, you know, simple, pure, simple speaking journalists, it's not going to be easy. I said, the best way to put everybody under one umbrella and let everybody contribute their two big point with their expertise into what we call as aging and long. And that led to genesis of this Longevity India initiative. So we have almost 20 plus faculty. There are machine learning guys, the AI, computational modelers, biomaterial specialists, immune system specialists, epigenetics, gut microbiome, you name it, is somebody who's put there. So the idea was to get everybody to bring their specialization under one umbrella and start working on a problem which needs a whole some holistic approach. And that's where we started Longevity. So involvement of Prashant was the nucleation Basically, you know, you can talk endlessly, but once you have some gel, which is in form of support, people start gelling automatically because, you know, we are not just talking, we are now in a position of doing something about it. So I think Prashant's contribution was absolutely instrumental in this gelation process where people actually readily came together and put their thoughts and energy to this initiative. That's where we are. As a supplementary question to what Prashant has initiated, how can public support uh, Longevity India? People like us, what can we do to enable further research programs and uh, support whatever your charter that you have defined at Longevity India? How can we be part of that journey and, and make it much more powerful and inclusive? Pavita, thank you, KK, for asking that question. First of all, I must, you know, emphasize the word which you use as inclusive, and that is the mandate of our issue. Inclusivity is what we are mandated. So if whosoever is interested, please check our Longevity India website. You will realize we have actually built this initiative in four pillars. And we call them pillars because it's all about inclusion. So there are four pillars. People like us who do deep science for a living. We have been trained in deep science and that's what we keep doing because that's what we are good at. But also there is a whole lot of clinicians who have to give us constant feedback and input to improve our understanding of human body. So a second pillar is clinician. A third pillar is something which KK will understand much nicely is the industry. Segment. Industry, no matter, you can call them devils because they want to make a profit because making profit is not bad. Industry is an absolutely integral segment because a lot of fundamental discoveries can be motivated by industrial demand if they 
there is a need, we need to cater to that need. If fundamental scientists and industry come together, we can meet that demand. So that's the third pillar. We have industry who was giving, lending us support of in terms of funding, in terms of idea, in terms of instrumentation, technology, and making things accessible to fundamental scientists. And the fourth, which is a very important pillar, is society. What I mean by society? Society includes people, again, KK belongs to one of them, policymakers, people who influence decision-making bodies. And why we want them? Because the awareness about longevity needs multiple formats of engagement. It needs government, it needs public, it needs clinician, it needs a lot of different type of people to come together to support this initiative. But also societal, in terms of a common man. You know, I say my team wants to look into longevity and aging of Indian population. Now, somebody might ask me, tell me what do we know about Indian aging? My answer is nothing, because we have not looked at systematically at a molecular level what happens in Indian aging. Our genes, our genetics, our diet, our lifestyle, everything is different. And we have never accounted for those factors. You have mentioned KK in the beginning, clocks of aging. This clock, that clock. These clocks are different. Indian clocks are going to be different. And we know that. We know that because our rules of aging are very different. First of all, this is where we think society can control. First, number one, when a person goes to a hospital, they say we are going for a health care assessment. Fundamentally, that's a problem because when we go to a hospital, we are going for sick care assessment. We're going to look for whether we are sick or not. We are not going for to check our health. We just go there, get a blood work and say we are not sick and we are okay with it. What Longevity India wants to do is a health care, health assessment. We want to onboard healthy Indian population so that we can study how healthy aging people look like so that we can understand if an unhealthy person comes, which organ in their body is have a different clock than their chronological. And that's where the discovery in terms of managing health care will happen. Building hospital is one ball game, but we need to understand what can we do to keep people out of it. And that's where I think public can support. So not only what we're trying to say is public can support us by you know contributing to this initiative. This is a very, very uh, resource intensive exercise. We are trying to work with a whiteboard. We need a lot of resources, a lot of support. We need more people like Prashant Prakash who are a little more adventurous in supporting fundamental science. Given that it's a root of this initiative is an IIC and IIC has been always on the in a forefront of modern science. We do emphasize that we will definitely make sure that we contribute to this cause in as many ways as possible. So we need societal contribution. We also need people who are in various age groups and clinically defined as healthy so we can start sampling them and understand pan India, how are East Indian versus North Indian versus South Indian body signatures look when they, you know, when they undergo age. So there is lots to be done. We have just begun. The road is long, my friend, and we can do with as much support as. Let's invoke Lord Ganesha once again yes. today on an auspicious day that we Absolutely. are all successful in doing it the Indian way. Yes. Since you mentioned the Indian way, I wanted to also discuss a few things, you know. See, there are many yogis in the Himalayas who are meditating and living for hundreds of years. I'm not yes. sure. There are many YouTubers who have visited and spoken to them and, and stuff like that. But the more important issue is that does yoga and meditation impact longevity? And that's the Indian contribution to longevity, I would say directly. Great point, Kate. So personal view, these are all my personal views, by the way, I must give a, a you know clear declaration. These are not views imposed by anybody or funder or institute. These are my personal views. You know, yoga, I, I think a lot of Indian science was way ahead of times. So a lot of our practices, which is there in India inherently, were adding a lot of deep understanding to human physiology. You know, while in India, we talk about various aspects of aging from, uh, uh, this is one country where we have Vradhasana. We actually endorse the concept of getting old. And we endorse the concept of getting old by going into a different phase of life. This is one country. Yoga is another thing. While people say, you know, I must do cardio and I must do a lot of muscle building. While muscle building is good and people have shown the people who have more muscle mass live longer and live healthier, the point of yoga is to maintain you know, suppleness, keeping it very supple, keeping it smooth. You know, no matter how old the door is, if the motions are smooth, nobody asks for age. And no matter how young the door is, a new door, if it starts creaking, people, the first thing I say, how old is this door? So I think it's a very valid point. A creaking body creates more noise, create, draws more attention. A smooth operating system draws least attention. Yoga is about that smooth. It's about living in harmony with the environment. Yoga does something, another fascinating thing to work about. Let's take an analogy of human body to a vehicle. You drive a vehicle on a highway at a steady state 
rate. You do not accelerate very rapidly. Do not brake too hard. You're actually going to get the best mileage of your brake. And we know it. Vehicle manufacturers always claim that. We also know that if you do that, no sudden braking, no sudden acceleration, your vehicle is going to run for a very, very long time. It's a well-established fact. Now, if you think of your, this as your body, if you do not accelerate, deaccelerate, you're going to, that means you do not overconsume. You do not starve yourself to death. You live longer. Yoga toils talks about moderation. It talks about making things simpler and in synchrony with your body. Yoga does not want you to do extremes. It wants you to do what your body is capable of handling without any discomfort. One of the main thing in yoga is about not addressing things to take it to discomfort level. Second thing oh, yoga does is very interesting. It slows down your breathing. It talks about very big emphasis in yoga about slow pranayama. Basically breathe and realize what you're breathing. And that's like moderating the, the vehicle speed. You normalize, you make it do not accelerate, do not de And that is one simple thing which will allow you in a healthy state because you are not abusing your. And yoga is about that. What can I do to my body that it is fit and it's not? So, yes, yoga is a fantastic way to impact longevity. It's a fantastic way to improve your health. But let's look at one simple way. Is yoga going to be just enough that me, we just do yoga and that will be enough? The answer is no. So, think about a lot of factors. If you're running a car, you also need to make sure you put a good gasoline, you put the good petrol. You also keep your interiors clean. So there is a maintenance which is required along with that yoga is the one which is the best month. So while you do yoga, you need to make sure that other aspects, good sleep, good nutrition, supplement, healthy social connections, you know, reduce anger and anxiety, they are going to make you. Live. Yoga is one of the main medium, but not sufficient. Necessary, not sufficient. Well put, I wanted to bring one of my personal experiences here. You know, my great grandmom, she died at the age yeah. of 90. Wow. And that's uh, why any standard is long. <laughs> yeah. And this is, I'm talking 25 or uh, 20, uh, 30 years ago. All right. All right. So that time, the average uh, female life expectancy was what, 58 or something like that. I'm talking of uh, Absolutely. 70s, early 70s. 70s. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. And, you know, there was a catastrophe happened. She had a fracture of the femur. Surgery was done. But then after that, there was a decay and decline. But till that yes. time, you know, she had a certain regimen. She would eat one time in a day. She would fast two days in a week and stuff like that. And yes. she may look frail, but bodily very strong yeah. and no muscle mass. Obviously, with her age, she must have lost her muscle mass and, and postmenopausal. But that brings me to a point here. You know, our Indian mythology, religion talks about fasting. And I saw this yes. in my great grandmother also, who may be following certain religious practices. But uh, there are certain religious and mythological practices about fasting. Fasting. Does fasting also increase life expectancy and improve longevity? Or are we missing something? Yes. This Let's is an Indian concept point. of religion and mythology. Yes. Well, actually, fasting is in every culture of the world in one form or another. Every religion in the world undertakes this uh, aspect of fasting and different flavors and formats. Very hard grain in India because India is always known to, you know, fast a bunch of days every month or every lunar calendar cycle. Yes, fasting has got clear positive impact on the body. Let's think about our gasoline tank in the vehicle. Let's think about that gasoline tank as a vehicle, which is uh, not a fixed capacity, but it's a balloon, which you can keep filling it up. Now, unless you figure out that you need to let some of the fuel which is there in the reserve used up, you're not undergoing, you're not going to allow the additional weight of your body to get out. So fasting is one way you give through this cycle of use and metabolism, and then you start filling it again. So it basically keep you supple. Uh, one. Second, our cells have got unique ability. You can starve them of nutrition. They trigger a process called autophagy. It means eating what is deposited in our body. It starts making use of available nutrition, available resources. And at a cellular level, it happens and at all organisms, organ system level it happens. So this is basically a cleansing mechanism where you use the reserves so you can actually restore this. It's like, you know, storing nutrition in the dep depots or the storehouses. But if you never access them, then they're going to rot. And that rot is going to cause infection. So the fasting allows the deposits to be utilized. So there is a circulation of the nutritional pool which is available to us. So I think, yes, fasting has always been associated with better new metabolic proof. People have shown time and again intermittent fasting or fasting for a certain day hours, 10 hours plus, always have a pro, you know, health 
benefits where you actually end up reducing inflammation markers, improve metabolic health. So given that thing, yes, uh, fasting has been always in the force. Also in multiple uh, models of you know aging, which we use study in the lab using various organisms, the only thing which has shown to have a life extending property has been caloric restriction. So you reduce the calorie, you live long. So it's been the mainstay of long life. Eat when you need, let the body demand that needs nutrition. That's always been the case for people who actually show better lives. We talk about a little bit further about mythology and Ayurveda. You see, there are certain people who are immortal, Anuman, Shiva, and yes, so many yes. of them. And then there are certain people in our mythology and Vedas that have lived, I think, centuries. And uh, now our modern Vedic science people are researching how long they have lived and what, uh, whatever, from what time BC to what time BC and they're trying to see if there are any fossils or whatever. I'm sure these are uh, certain ancient practices which were uh, part of our Vedic practices and which had given longevity to the people in the past. I want to understand how do we revive these ancient practices? I mean, I've been part of certain other platforms and have kind of been working on, on this because of my own interests. But how do we kind of revive these practices and make it much more mass oriented and acceptable? which probably would have an incidental benefit of longevity as well. So it's an interesting question. I would not talk much about mythology because mythology is called mythology for a reason. That is that absence of clear, tangible evidence, which is what makes mythology. A lot of history has become mythology simply because of lack of clear evidence. That does not mean they are right. That does not mean they did not occur. That does not necessarily mean what mythology is saying is cannot be achieved. If possible, but again, I don't have an evidence to say either way. Now, coming back to there, what were the practices which they must be doing, which probably allowed such fascinating aspects of immortality or long life to be talked about? So I think a lot of our in ancient knowledge uh, is in the lost domain, basically either because of loss, because of you know the country has been invaded so many times. So we have lost that ancient knowledge because of natural calamities, floods, and so on and so forth. Those knowledge is lost. But again, a lost knowledge does not necessarily mean we cannot visit those arts. So as I said, a lot of Indian knowledge was far ahead of the curve in terms of understanding. A lot of those understanding took form of spiritual aspects because those aspects are easy to understand for a common man's perspective. scientific nitty gritties uh, gets muddled for a lot of people and that's why they do not get practiced very frequently whereas spirituality becomes gets practiced because it's easy for people to understand because we always associate with the unknown or just always associate with the supreme and that's how it works very well what is lost in our under current understanding of life a lot of things have been lost we have stopped following a natural diet which is at the heart of a lot of our early you know know, sciences or early natural thing. Our uh, medical system used to treat an individual as a whole, not an organ specific treatment. We used to do a lot of emph emphasis on our holistic healing. A lot of that thing is coming back, but what a lot of knowledge in process of being specialist got lost. So it's now we need to figure out how to recover that. That's a big problem. Number one. Second thing is the availability of nutrition, which is predominantly carbohydrate rich diet, has undercut a lot of our efforts, which we have, you know, our Indian system laid emphasis on that is the way we say it ki eat according to the season the seasonal consumption of food has actually changed because it's we are able to grow everything in it right the cycling of food the nutrition value that has gone away taking the aspect of stage what we eat in what place basically there are food which is an india specific food which grew and which allowed us to live that way that local hyper local consumption has actually been lost again we have become in every Indian is now a global citizen. And this global citizenship is hitting us maximally in terms of our health indices. We have signs of more. India takes pride on everything also, but we should feel bad that we are the diabetes capital, cancer capital, GI capital, everything. Because we just have too many people who are suffering from these problems because we have uh, more or less bypassed the local doctrine of we have actually changed the way we started living. So people say there's a benefit of sitting down and eating. Uh, there's a benefit on how 
how you consume with your food with your hand you consume your biome your microbiome which comes with the your body start listening to what your body tells so there's a lot of things which our mythology or basically ancient indian history practice as a norm those norms have been lost because of global citizenship of india so those norms are what uh, we are actually going to be loser in this race because that's where everything is i think this should also become part of the research agenda at uh, lanuate india also looking at yeah, what was in the is. past and what could we revive back yes yes so the biggest problem is we don't even know what we have lost and that that bottleneck is going to hurt us big time because you know incomplete knowledge is far more dangerous than the you know not knowing anything now we're trying to bring back a lot of ancient wisdom without even knowing what we are lo- have lost in the process so this is going to be a very very difficult task because i can teach in a blank slate i can write something completely new but in a slate which has got something already written i need to make believe that the story is as per i would like to hear to it so that becomes a problem i would like to shift a little bit from mythology to our modern medicine and healthcare and you know there are some poster boys in india now yes. very recently india today group got in dr sinclair author of lifespan yes. and his wife yes. and he talked about uh, several things that he follows and he's also a guinea pig to his own uh, body about what he takes yes. and whatever he knows at harvard and what's going on i would love to get your take he's talked about several issues but since our healthcare life sciences manifesto is a five year horizon and thing i would love to to kind of get your take on whatever has been talked about and there's a whole ton and ton of content on the media and in and yes. the internet as to you know which what do you think would hold immediate promise and outcome say in the next 5 years and i would like to start picking up couple of these approaches to longevity the first of them would be nutraceuticals i also take certain high end nutraceuticals which is what shows on me and my body does it hold promise and people have been trying a lot of things as well so is it good or bad do we know what sort of outcomes does it give to longevity okay let me ask the question back you said you take some nutraceutic let me ask one thing. i would not ask you what you take because that will become a product publicity but yes. i'll ask you one simple thing is that the only thing you should do towards your longevity or your health is that the only thing you do do you just consume nutraceutical do you not sleep properly do you not interact with people socially do you not eat healthy food do you not exercise right so if your answers are not for all of them and you think nutraceuticals are only thing you are doing for your body i would believe nutraceuticals are working so what's well, your answer I'm, i'm coming from a supplementation point of view what my no, body I'm, is I'm doing asking, with what's your no yes, i do all of my it. question is except hey, exactly, a little bit on the sleep side exactly. work so so the work not, not is something see, that takes me on wrong times sometimes i have to wake up at 5 okay. in the morning and come and have a call or sometimes i have to wake up so, or keep myself awake till 1 in the night as well but then i catch yes. it up over the weekend or something so like now that. now let's let's revisit that question that why did you start taking this why do we do other things because you were cognizant of the issue or aware of the issue that with aging your body undergoes deterioration and it needs addressing and you approach that addressing aspect by multi pronged approach which means you add ended up addressing one two three four aspects which is what you said work nutraceutical alone are not sufficient the first aspect is awareness that your body needs mending your body needs healing your body needs repair and once you have that awareness you would make multi pronged changes in your life and lifestyle so longevity and aging is basically at heart an issue of lifestyle management and once you have understood nutraceuticals are just a small pillar a small add on to the whole gamut of things which are doing in your body which is allowing you to work with maximum efficiency appreciate your physiological well being and that's where nutraceutical alone is never going to be sufficient you cannot repair a broken car with a touch or dash of paint you need a systemic overall that awareness is almost the part i want to bring very important yes very very serious subject here obviously dr sinclair made it very public he is taking certain prescription drugs like metformin certain immunosuppressant certain biologic we also had people who are looking at towards marijuana as well yes. for anti inflammation and stuff like that and in uh, in indian culture marijuana consumption has been there for ages although societally now with regulation it's been restricted but it's opening up uh, globally as well 
well. Yeah. What are the pros or what are the dangers of getting into these sort of products for ensuring that you're, you're arresting some of those metabolic issues in your body or repairing yourself? Is it advisable or is it not advisable? How do you see that? So the way I see it is very simple. That is prescription drugs are called prescription drugs for a very simple reason. They are for a pathology. They need to be consumed under medical supervision. And there's no magic. First of all, there is no magic. Pill. If you look at all the list of drugs or molecules, all these longevity champions consume, they have two very simple motivations. Improve metabolic health, reduce inflammation. Now the question one should ask to themselves is, can I do the same by something else? Can I achieve the same outcome by um, other means? For example, can I control my metabolic intake, reduce my carbohydrate intake, improve my protein intake, right? If I start taking more plant phytophenols, do I really need to take immunosuppressant? Do I really need to take anti-inflammatory? Because my physiological inflammation has come down. If I reduce the sugar intake in my body, my metabolic health has come down. So all this prescription drug is like additives in your food, which have low nutritional value, but have more palatable. So they probably make you feel good about that your metabolism has improved. But if you do major lifestyle management changes, which is definitely not the most uh, what you call palatable and very interesting changes is for which one would make. Who doesn't want to eat their samosas every other day? Who does not want to eat paratas? Who does not want to eat sweets? As long as you keep doing that, you have to keep relying on this prescription driven drugs because you are actually abusing your metabolism. But if you slow down those as these drugs will have at best a minuscule additive value. So yes, prescription drugs are prescription for a reason. Unless there is a need, don't go for these things. Especially self-administration without medical reason is not going to be great. Immunosuppressants works in the West beautifully. India is a tropical country where bacteria, fungus, human being, enzyme, you know, insects live together. So can you think about what will happen to you if you take immunosuppressant? You will definitely not die because of it. Because probably you will not even reach that stage. So I like cigarettes, we should have a statutory warning. Yes. Could be injurious to health. Well, it could be injurious to you. It's just not your health completely. <laughs> yeah. I want to now bring, you know, certain celebrities have done certain things and that went as a rage. So Michael Jackson used to go and sleep in a hyperbaratic chamber, yes. right? And now there are certain sports people and mountaineers who actually do the reverse. They go for hypoxia related therapies. Yes, yes, yes. Now the science is pivoted on both sides for yes. longevity. Is it yes. advisable to go once a year in a hyperbaratic chamber for a few hours? Uh, I mean, I've done it once. You know what, recreation, uh, let, but, let's, uh, let's look at the world. Let's look at the world around us. You go to Nordic country, do sauna, it helps. Go to Russia, do a chill ice water. Go to Japan, sulfur bath, eat fish. Go to France, eat meat, drink wine. So every country has their own, you know, special things which they do. Again, not enough data to support anything either. There's not enough trial, not enough controlled studies to say it works or not. Recent studies in one, you know, organism says hypoxia is good. Some hyperbaric experiment. So all these things are, they, they are used to flush your body. Think about that. All you're trying to do is resetting your metabolism, resetting inflammation. So you feel suddenly rejuvenated. You start feeling good about yourself. And that's all we are, they are playing. We do not know the long-term implication of therapy. There's not enough data to support one from another. So from my perspective, I will refrain from saying anything works because evidence exists for everything, but there's not enough data to say they should be. Again, checkbox for statutory warning. Yes. I like to come You, you down. might want to say. Sorry. You might want to think about what are you doing it. I think if you start asking this question to people, you'll be shocked by the real answer that you're 99% of just doing for the feel good fact. That's it. You ask how many of them doing this for the long run, the answer is not going to be there. Most of the athletes in the world, they are not the longest living individuals. So that should tell you that a lot of these things may not have a clear implication bearing on long life. Well put. I want to bring up one other practice of, you know, in India, obviously, a lot of uh, people have frozen the umbilical cord uh, for future use. At yes. some point in time, it's an insurance for their future. And a lot of it is now frozen. And now comes yes. this whole emerging thing of young plasma transfusion or using cord blood banked uh, thing for rejuvenation and regeneration. And there is a stat. It's about how many crores of cord bank banking and has been banked. And that yes. population is now in their 30s. Started yes. somewhere around that time. <clears throat> is this something acceptable or is it something that needs further validation before they unbank and start using it for uh, 
their age related uh, harvesting uh, purposes again not enough evidence for right. value proposition high realizable value unknown so from that simple perspective yes i think uh, human beings ever since we learned the art of storing we are storing everything if you think from a time immemorial we started storing you know pickles and making murabbas and everything we love storing because we do not know when we going to need it next kab zarurat pad jaye so i think the latest healthcare system has allowed us to store everything people even store their you know blood draws people store their plasma we never know what we going to the idea sounds fascinating but i don't think we've reached the level of maturity in terms of our scientific understanding that the clear tangible use of them is realized it may happen in future i would not deny it. i would not say no i would not say yes it's a matter of time we have to wait and watch are we ready to put something right now i don't think so. because again no long term study has been done but again that does not mean it should not be done or cannot be done it's definitely doable definitely something which people should invest in so there are people who are dedicated to understanding the utility of this you know material perhaps they are in a better position to answer that right now no obvious use is clear on for this material so this is on the hold i sell hold i would say unless our warning. understanding comes becomes very i want to move to this whole thing of rebooting reprogramming and there is different streams of sciences working on chemistry genetic and other biology as well how near or how far are we to actually now bring this to reality is it 20 more years before people you know, can say that this would be something that would be a reality technically speaking we have always been rebooting our body by fasting we have always been rebooting our body by undergoing as you call in indian system navratra we will fast right. for many days get the gut cleanse get repopulated get the tissues organs and the body undergo reset we been doing this reprogram what are these other reprogram you talking about these are the fast reprogramming protocol if you want or yeah. the reprogramming for long term commercial ways is a commercial so yes it, it's like the, the fundamental difference for most of the people amaruti is efficient but people still aim for mercedes so these are all reprogrammings are mercedes of the healthcare system doable possibly how far maybe not very far maybe close but what are they relying on the chemical molecules which we relying on a predict it come back to the same arsenal of chemicals which we give to people to reset or affect the longevity so ultimately the buck is the the program is rotating on the same thing what can i do to improve my metabolic and immune health what can i do to improve my you know renal or uh, hepatic or liver health these are the simple things which people are looking at anything which improves those functions would have an implication and it's a matter of time where we have to see how it's going to be. i know a lot of scientists like you would always push back on ayurveda but on the internet now there are a whole host of you know you go to facebook you go to and there are all these ayurvedic solutions that will do your metabolism or microbiome gut microbiome reprogram you all that obviously like chinese traditional medicine we have not invested a lot in in clinical validation what do you suggest uh, and obviously scientists many scientists that i have worked in the past in my avtas say that this is just a placebo effect and this is what okay, uh, let, let, let me let me correct you here. again my personal thing i disagree that ayurveda is uh, something which we disagree with. i think it's something which a lot of scientists realize that ayurveda perhaps works on a slow and steady bolus of resetting the metabolic and physiological rather than our existing design of quick fix solution which is what the drugs industry so that transition and thought process is indeed occurring in a lot of scientists and a lot of global scientists also so it would be uh, incorrect to say that we are not endorsing ayurveda we are all endorsing ayurveda from a simplistic view point that given that the evidence based uh, examples of ayurveda are low we have not investigated molecular mechanisms of ayurvedic p the integration of ayurvedic healing system to a common person is low because the quick fix solution seems to have worked for very long aging is one process which i always tell people will not do with quick fix it needs long term it's resetting a body to the best metabolic state so it will take time and ayurveda probably is much better placed in dealing with these changes than any other you know courses of medicine as i said ayurveda is about a general physiological science which are all about all organs in total and it 
links gut to everything, which is all the modern biology is now talking about gut brain, gut mind, gut heart, gut everything. It's a gut access to everything. So yes, people have woken up to aspect of gut drives a lot of change. And Arvind has been talking about it for forever that gut drives, and people have now clear evidence to show that if your gut is leaky, means your gut has got barriers which has been infringed upon or broken, you show signs of accelerated aging because your inflammatory markers goes up, your metabolic health comes down. There are evidence to show gut is a major cause because evidence-based medicine has been implemented there. Ayurveda needs that. We've been exploring options of engaging with Ayurveda charyas to understand that if we can start collecting molecular markers of Ayurvedic, uh, you know, individual categorization and therapeutic responses, we would be able to bring evidence to the, the you know, notorious Ayurvedic just simply because we have not tried to align with. There have been two schools of thoughts for a very long, the allopathic and the Ayurveda. There, need, there is a need to integrate these schools of thought. While the evidence from the allopathic medicine is very, very clear, they are not, uh, you know, they are very evidence-driven approaches taken. Ayurveda systems believe in healing. They are not worried about evidence because evidence tend to vary between it. But I think this good time we can amalgamate and bring to these two streams together and bring them to the mainstay that they there is evidence of certain Ayurvedic practices which implicate and implicitly affect our health. I mean, Ayurveda medicines are loaded with phytophenols, loaded with plant-based nutrients, which has been shown to positively affect life. A lot of these anti-aging drug molecules are actually there in some form or another in one of the Ayurvedic traditions. Avleya, you know, we call it. Avleya Correct. is a very popular form. And we uh, talk the Grita form, the lipid-soluble fraction of nutrition. We now know the lipid-soluble and whatever soluble fractions are different and impl implicitly affect our health differently. There is a value. We have been dominated by the Western thought because it was evidence-based, but now is the right time to bring that evidence to our system also. So there is a lot about integrating traditional medicine with uh, yes. modern medicine Absolutely. and genetics to create Absolutely. a holistic uh, approach to longevity. Yes. So if you look from an Indian perspective, uh, we have this different temperaments of an individual, Kapha, Pitha, Vata. Can we do a genetic analysis that is there an association of some genes to these three different forms. Actually, there could be three, there could be bi, or there could be three features. So there could be multiple gender and metabolic features, which Ayurveda has always captured. Can we bring genetics to that? Can we bring epigenetics? Can I bring metabolic indicators of those individuals? I think that is a way a lot of interesting things will be done in a country like India. Very interesting topic. Now that we are talking about this whole Ayurveda, I want to also understand, would Longevity India also do certain amount of policing because there's a proliferation of services, both allopathic, Ayurvedic, available online. People have been cheated. Nothing happens or there. there's a decay or decline also and deterioration of their health as well because they're getting gullibly led by these sort of services online. Is there going to be uh, or are you going to start looking at policy to even, you know, work with the government to organize this whole unorganized sector, which is brooming, mushrooming online and also do some amount of education of consumers? So interesting question, KK. So policing is something which I think bodies like government, we are information generators and information providers. And we would like to stay in that role because ultimately we have to believe in the evidence which we generate. If evidence supports certain impact of a certain nutraceutical or therapeutic entity, we will present the way it comes. And if some evidence suggests that X, Y, Z is not doing what it's supposed to do, it will be present. It is up to the policy makers that how do they decide to regulate the proliferation and market for uh, everything about. However, as said that, most of our study which we're doing under longevity India, the findings will be made public. So public would be free to consume that information and make their own decision. I think these days with that technology and media being a very dominant force in a person's decision making process, longevity India has got a very active social outreach channel where we bring the people with scientific law, you know, training to talk about various aspects like metabolic health and so on and so forth. We actually have constantly being engaging with the public. So ultimately, if the information is out there, I think the public will get, will be smart enough to know what our evidence is just gullible, time of being gullible, time of being the snake doctor is gone. The media percolation in, in, in India is dramatically huge. And I think that no, I also had a lot of backlash when we released our uh, manifesto saying this is not going to happen in India.
India. India is not prepared for it and, and, and stuff like that. I said, well, you know, well we always, we always, India has always been an underdog. India has never been prepared for a lot of things and India still comes out because we are historically very resilient. Country. We are very, very able to come back with adverse things very rapidly. And that resilience is what makes us very unique. And I think while we adapt to things very rapidly because of resilience, we also in the process lose what makes us unique. So I think there has to be a fine balance between resilience and identity in, in the long phrase in the scheme of things. I want to ask a few rapid fire questions. Obviously, we are now running a little bit behind time. Uh, when will humans achieve near mortality, immortality? Not in my lifetime. Give me a year, 2050, 20... That's it. That's my answer. 2075. Uh, see, from my personal perspective, I'm not interested. In the motor so near immortality, I, say, I would say. If we, we gain immortality, then we are gods. I think uh, the number is difficult to put on this because you still we are on the surface. We are scratching the surface of longevity right now. So the answer would be we should be prepared for surprises, but it is difficult to nail on. When does uh, longevity treatment become unethical? As long as they keep calling, calling themselves as lifespan extender, extending treatment, they are unethical, I would say. As long as they keep calling them health span extenders, I think they are absolutely fine. The whole idea of living forever, I think that is something I personally don't understand. Now, tied to that, obviously, is with longevity, will euthanasia will also be legalized? Interesting yeah, question. Again, yeah, said, yeah, jite, jite, it, it's I a want, fascinating question. It's a fascinating question. A fascinating question, but I think this is a debate which needs a lot more stakeholders than you and I alone, uh, which which should include a lot of uh, you know uh, people who have lived healthy, long life and taken their opinion would actually be a really crucial part here. Euthanasia, though, sounds interesting. It's it's a very, you know, interesting ethical dilemma, which is not easy to address. So uh, I would not even, uh, you know, try to understand this aspect because it goes into those gray zones where opinions, personal opinions tend to color the global thing. So it's it's not something uh, which we can say right now, will it be legalized? Or not? My major problem now is that many of our doctors who are also wanting longevity, those doctors who I have worked with in my age group who passed yes. out their MBBS in their 80s are now also hitting for in that uh, time zone of, you know, wanting to practice longevity or even, you know, get certain remedies for themselves. Yes. How do we train our current lot of physicians in this science of longevity? I think uh, the most interesting part of longevity is to understand the weak link in your body, understand which organ in your body is ticking at a different rate than rest of your body. But that weak link is going to be the driver for your future healthcare problem needs. And that identifying that weak link is going to be the most important aspect in our broad vision of long. Because if I can identify that weak link early on, I can make changes in an individual in terms of their lifestyle to think about shifting a clinician's role from a curative person to a preventive healthcare practitioner. And that's what is needed in there now. We do not need more hospitals, but we need people who will champion health over sickness. So we need healthcare practitioners, which is what everybody calls themselves are. They're actually sick care practice. We need to shift to healthcare. People who Obviously, it's champion. a paradigm shift, uh, you know, and many healthcare leaders also have been talking about it. I yes. want to understand, you mentioned that you are also creating content and program for CME for physicians and doctors as well, and you're going to be launching that sometime in the future. Would that really help the cause for longevity. Absolutely, absolutely. The way it sees is the more. So human being is a very interesting creature. We believe what we see. We very much. This is a, seeing is believing. So I think the more information which is made accessible to a clinician, a physician, or healthcare practitioner, the more they will buy into this idea about maintaining health. More they will be able to make early decisions, whether it is preventive rather than curative, predictive rather than diagnosing. We would have, we will undergo that shift in thought process. In it. it will happen. It will happen once we make data information available to the clinicians. There are a lot of health parameters in India are still based on the Western data. Correct. We have not methodologically collected Indian data. So one of the first things which we're doing in this exercise of longevity is collecting Indian data, collecting Indian health parameters to understand with age. If this feature changes naturally in healthy aging people, you don't need to intervene. If a healthy Indian, as they get older, 
cholesterol goes up, I don't want to give them therapies for managing the cholesterol. Cholesterol is just using as an example here. But they, we don't have that information. You know? We always have a broad ballpark number of healthcare parameters, which is coming from Western data. We need that data. In it. Maybe the data is already available with a lot of you know uh, labs, diagnostic labs around. Yeah, the Framingham score world. doesn't apply to Indians and uh, Indian genetics. Yes, yes, yes. So while we need, we really need to relook at the information which is available, define uh, Bharat standards for Indian healthcare and work with. That's why the India is one country where always being the greeting with Ayushman Baba, may you live long and happy. that can only be achieved once we understand what the actually our health is trying to tell us. Well, you talked about data. Now our digital India initiative is there. Aadhaar is there. A lot of other things are there. How do we make it easy for our seniors and people who will be becoming seniors to contribute their lifestyle and other parameters to a data lake which could be used uh, for training and research purposes? The this point is where is this data? That's the biggest biggest challenge is where is this data? Sitting is with this Android. Data usable? Is it data usable? <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. We need data which is our data, accessible data, using which we can design, you know, approaches to handle people before they get sick. Access to data is a major problem. You have seven, you know, we have 100 million data points available in a lot of hospitals. In it. Most of them are unreadable, unusable, non-digital format. We need high quality digital data. That's what we want to generate first in the first phase of the study. Doc, my last question, how do we contribute to your journey and longevity India? And I think what's your message is... to the public at large? How do they become a larger force to longevity India on the ground? I think there's a, like, okay, like, let me answer the question one, which is how do we contribute? So, you know, most of the biology or research and medicine have always taken a very interesting route. And the route has been, what can I do in my study, which will allow me to give my answers quickly? So we've always been an accelerated mode. Uh, for example, I make an app, launch it tomorrow. Studying aging cannot be accelerated, thankfully. We need to work with people who are of various age groups. So one thing which we need from people is support, support in any form they can think of, access to technology, resources, policy changes, so funding support. I mean, we are, as a country, our priorities always been placed at different places which were at the right time, the right time. We need a little bit more unconstrained support to invest in aging. One. Two, we need people to volunteer to come us to ask for sampling. We realize Indians have a very interesting bottleneck for health data collection because we always think if data has been collected, that means we are sick. Now, when we have to collect data for healthy people, we have a very fundamental challenge. If I want to go to an individual, I said, I want to collect, give me some blood so I can see how healthy you are. They simply say, no. Why should I give you blood when I'm not sick? So that's a problem here. I want to look at a healthy gut biome. Our societal implications on giving blood or stool sample is linked to sickness. We request society to actually come forward who are healthy people to give us healthy samples so we can define how a healthy gut, healthy blood, healthy blood profile looks like. We are having a very interesting challenge. We cannot walk to hospital and ask for sample because in hospitals, you get sick people. We want healthy people. They are not in hospital. We need to reach out. So it's a very interesting challenge which we have taken up in our hands and we would need support from as many quarters as possible. So that's one. How can society contribute to this? And I'm sorry, what is the second question was? People like us and the society at large so that the blessing of Aishman Bhava Bharat, happens to the whole Bhava, team yes. at Longevity India and Longevity India contributes back to the whole society. Yes. And the yes. people being Aishman Bhava, blessing from uh, Longevity Actually, India. It's a, it's a very symbolic say, uh, relationship now that we are going to be forging. Yes. Yeah, so today is a very a nice day. So actually, today is with Lord Ganesha's blessing, we can say Aishman Bhava to entire India. The idea here is very simple. Simple idea says, how can you live happy? How can you live dignified? How can you contribute to the society as a meaningful society? Remember, there are multiple. Ways. I think we people have to change their mindset that once a person is retired, they are not a contributing member to the society. We must be vigilant and aware about the fact that every individual needs dignity in their and that's the most important part. And the dignity comes by appreciating health as it stands. Learn to realize your health, you know, how, what are the limitations of health and take care of your Eat well, sleep well, exercise a bit. Nobody else is going to come and help you out in your health because that's the way which will give you dignity when you are getting. And that's the message. I really appreciate you giving the time and the message. And I hope this podcast also runs far and wide, uh, taking the message and also helps rebooting the age of 
the Indian population and people globally who are listening to us as well. On behalf of my team, Deepak, I wanted to thank you a lot for being very candid and open, talking about various depth of subject matter, which we cannot cover in depth. This is, a, as you mentioned in the beginning of our podcast or so, it's an ocean and it may need podcast after podcast for next five years to cover yes, the whole yes. subject matter. But I guess this is a great teaser to start with this whole concept of longevity. And I'm sure in the next few years time, I'm going to hold you back to say where have we reached, where are we going and what's happening. So we'll probably uh, also try and measure and recalibrate because I also want to do recalibrate these 40 bets that we are taking. How are these things moving on the ground with the startups, with the industry and everything? And obviously with the research institutions as well. So that would be a great uh, way to understand and calibrate. But I would love to say that the message that you're given, Ayushman Bhava, is aptly put. And I think we I should have changed my podcast title to Ayushman Bhava instead of rebooting it. Thank you so Better much for your time. Never. Thank you, KK. Thank you for inviting. And I hope uh, to talk to you soon. Lovely. I will catch up with you in Bangalore soon. Sure. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.